Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service here at Yoker Evangelical Church. It's lovely to see you all here this morning. Um, we're gathered here today so that we can worship God. So just as we begin our time together, let's pray to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you because this morning you are on your throne. Today, Lord, nothing can remove you from there. There will never come a day where you are not on your throne. And Lord, through all life's uncertainties and doubts, you will never change. You are always secure. Father, we ask that you would forgive us for the times when we have doubted. Uh, when we believe the lie, either that you're not there or that you don't care for us. Father, we thank you that Jesus was the sinless saviour who sets us free to follow you. Lord, united with him, nothing can remove us. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would help us to worship and to glorify you through all we do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing a song just now that again reminds us that Jesus is on his throne, before the throne of God above. So I invite you to stand just as the music starts. Um, boys and girls, hello, good morning. Uh, we are going to learn just a wee bit of scripture this morning. We're going to learn a memory verse together. Um, this is partly because we finished our, verse, our church vision statement um, and we had a couple of weeks to kill until Christmas, I'm being brutally honest. But it's really good to learn scripture together. So over the next two weeks, we're going to learn two verses that I bet loads of you already know. We're just going to learn them again together so that we can encourage each other with them. Um, so, and we're going to learn actions with them as well. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is that jumping around is really fun. It's really fun to like wave your arms around and stuff. And the other is that sometimes doing things with your body can help you remember words. And they can help you see the meaning behind them. Yeah? We're going to do actions, okay? Um, Sandra, could we get the words up on the screen, please? Thank you. Yeah, so we're going to be learning Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. 
Can you stick your hand up if you think you already know those verses? Okay, a good amount of you, but not everyone. So, these are good verses to do then. Um, So, if you're able, can I invite you please to stand up and we'll do these actions together. Okay. Alright, so this week, all we're going to focus on is doing that first verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Okay? And we're going to do actions for those words just to help us get them in our heads. Okay? Yeah? Some of you are going to really enjoy this. Some of you are really not going to. That's fine. Um, So the first bit there is trust. Now we need a good solid word for trust because trust is solid. When we're saying that you trust in the Lord, it's not that you're thinking that he might be there, it's that you know he will be there. So our action for trust is going to be just jumping. Okay? So we are going to say, trust. Right, let's all do that together. Trust. Okay? Because you know the ground is going to be there. You know that when you jump, the ground will catch you. Most of us do. You know that when you jump, the ground is there. And you know that when you trust in the Lord, he will be there. So we are going to go trust in. In. So point in. Okay. And then the Lord. Okay. So let's do what we've got. Trust in the Lord. Okay. And then with all your heart. So our action for all is going to be just doing a big wide circle with our arm. All. Okay. With all. All, because you're saying it's all the whole thing. So trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do we heart with your fingers? Isn't that nice? Okay, so let's do what we've got. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay, and lean. Well, leaning is kind of doing that. Lean, lean. If you're next to somebody shorter than you or somebody sitting down, You could lean on them. And lean, okay, lean not. So you're going to tie an arm, tie a knot with your arms. Okay, because you're not to lean on your own understanding. Now, I thought long and hard about an action for understanding. Uh, But I think the best one is just to do an understanding face. Do we understand it? Okay, if you were really thinking about something hard, you might go, hmm, hmm, hmm understanding so put that together that would be lean not on your own understanding okay all right let's try and put all that together so we go trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding that's great Uh, Would any of the boys and girls like to come up and help me do the actions? Yeah, Alistair? Anyone else? Yeah? Go on. Anyone else? No? (laughs) You didn't have to say no. Okay. All right. Let's just do it a couple of times, and you guys are going to help us learn it, okay? So, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That was really good. Well done. Alistair, Michael, which side of the room do you think would be louder? Probably this side. Yeah, I think this side of the room is going to be louder. I'm looking at the people on this side of the room and thinking they are going to go properly loud. Why don't we see which side is louder? Why don't you guys do it with that side and I'll do it with this side? Okay, shall I go first? Yeah, so this side of the room, everybody from this side onwards, okay, let's do it louder than that side, right? So we are going to go, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That was good, well done. What have you guys got? You guys going to lead it? Good. That was pretty good. Which which side do you think was louder there? That one. Shall we have shall we have another go? Try it again. Okay? So this side of the room. Let's prove once and for all that we're the loudest. Okay? 
I can see the passion in your eyes here. Right? One more time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Yeah? What do you guys got? You know, I think you guys definitely had more fun doing it. And that's worth something. Um, okay, that's brilliant. Next week, we're going to learn the next bit. And it's going to involve a whole host of other actions. That's going to be good. Uh, but just now, one of the ways that can help us really learn verses of the Bible is by singing them together. And it encourages us. Um, so, you guys didn't know this when you agreed to come up on stage. But we're going to sing now. Uh, so we're going to just sing a song that has those verses in it. Um, if you're watching at home on the video, uh, unfortunately because of copyright, you won't hear the screen. So feel free to come up with your own tune for what you think this would sound like. <laughs> uh, but if you're here in the building, the music will play over the speakers and we're just going to try and do the actions as we sing through it. Okay? So let's sing. Well done, guys. Uh, next week, we're going to do the second half of that verse. But just now, boys and girls, um, would you like to head out to Sunday school? Good jumping, a lot of you. Well done. 
I know that was a lot, but you did a good job. Um, just a couple of notices uh, for the life of the church. The first one, as always, is that our 5 p.m. service will be on this afternoon. Um, so if you'd like to come along, it's a wee bit more casual. We sit around tables and then we eat a meal together. So at the very least, there is free food. Um, so do please come along to our 5 p.m. service. Uh, we've also got our prayer meeting on a Wednesday. That's at half past... No, this week, it's the business meeting. Um, so that's also at half past seven. Uh, if you're a member of this church or you'd like to find out more about what's going on, uh, do come along at half past seven for our church business meeting. It's our quarterly or half yearly. It's one of them. <laughs> uh, we also have a men's breakfast coming up. I think that's this Saturday. Yeah? Um, what time is that at, David? Nine. Okay, good. You're not just missing a thumb. Uh, so that's at nine o'clock this Saturday. If you're a man and if you eat breakfast, do please come along and we'll enjoy some good food there together. Uh, also to say next week is our gift Sunday um, and you'll find the notices for that just on the doors as you go out. And to remind you again, if you would like to give financially to the work of the church, please feel no obligation to do so. Um, but if you would like to give something, we won't be passing around the bags at the moment. We just have boxes that are on the wall as you go back out of this room at the end. Uh, so that's how you can give to the work of this church. We're going to sing again just now, um, a song with slightly less actions. Um, and we're just going to sing uh, a very famous song written by a guy called Martin Luther, um, Our God Stands Like a Fortress Rock. Now, it's the same tune that you'll know. It might be slightly different words. Uh, so we're just using a wee bit of a different translation, but it will be the same song, the same content. So I'd invite you just now to stand together as we sing, Our God Stands Like a Fortress Rock. Let's stand.
take your seats. Um, I'd like to invite Patrick Schwartz up. Uh, Patrick is going to be preaching for us today, and it would be lovely just to get to know him a wee bit first. Um, hi. So, hi, Patrick. Hello. Hello. That's a funny accent you have. Yeah. Where are you from? So, our family is from New England uh, in the States. Uh, we've been in Glasgow for five years, though. That's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, where do you stay? In Partick. Oh, lovely. Yeah. That's good. Uh, so, what was it that made you move from New England to Glasgow? Oh, man. Was it so the weather? It was the, it was the weather, for sure. <laughs> we love us a good rain. So, no, uh, it, it was the Lord's just calling our family here. Um, I was working with campus ministry and with a church back in the States, um, and we had some, some friends who were in that circle back in the Boston area who had come to work with a mission agency here. Um, my wife Erin and I came in the summer of 2014, fell in love with Glasgow, um, recognized um, there was a, there's still great need for more churches, more workers, laborers in the gospel, and so that began a, a two-year process of us thinking, how can we uproot our lives there and get here? And so that was uh, summer of 2014 where that process began, and then we moved here December 2016. That's brilliant. So you're here now. And um, what, kind of day-to-day, what is your job now? Yeah, so uh, as missionaries, we, we are about equipping the church to do the, the task of making disciples, multiplying evangelism efforts, training up leaders. Um, our family is uh, based uh, out of Refuge Church in the south side um, in, in Pollock Shaw. So uh, we, we, that's our, our church home. Uh, we serve there most Sundays, um, but we're also about uh, connecting with other churches, connecting with other church leaders, um, and advancing the gospel uh, across Glasgow and then beyond across Scotland. That's great. It's lovely to have you here this morning. It's lovely uh, to be here. What are some ways that we can be praying for you at the moment? Yeah, uh, you can be praying for our church. So our church meets in the Borough Hall in Pollock Shaws, um, but it's not the most uh, advantageous situation. We get bounced around a lot based on other scheduling conflicts, and um, it, it's not even necessarily the most strategic location for us because there are some healthy churches nearby. Um, and so you can be praying for wisdom for our leaders uh, and for an opportunity for a, a building to open up that would be a strategic place for the church to, to root into the community. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. You'll be preaching Psalm 3 later on. Yes, yes. That's brilliant. Um, well, let's commit those things to the Lord in prayer just now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, for your care and protection that we can depend on through many dangers, through many difficult seasons. Lord, we remember that you keep hold of your own. Father, we pray that you would give us strength when we feel weary. Lord, we pray particularly for those at the moment who are feeling beaten down and tired and weak. Lord, those who don't know how they can continue, who feel heavy laden. We ask that you would comfort them, that you would give them rest. And Father, we give you thanks for Patrick and for Aaron moving over here, um, for this passion that they have to see the church in Scotland built up so that more people will come to know the Lord Jesus. Uh, Father, please would you help them in their ministry? Please would you especially help Refuge Church at the moment? Lord, give wisdom to their leaders as they think about what lies in the future. Uh, Would you give them wisdom for how best they can serve you at the moment? Lord, we long to see thriving churches throughout Glasgow um, so that the gospel can be held out to as many people as possible. And Lord, we ask that you would use Refuge Church in that and that you would continue to use Patrick and Aaron in their work through that. Father, we pray especially for the preaching of your word this morning. Uh, We ask that you would help each one of us to listen to what you are saying to us through it and that you would transform our hearts Lord, turn our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh by your word. Help us to depend on you more and to give you the glory. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Just before Patrick comes up to preach to us from Psalm 3, uh, we're going to sing again just another song that encourages us to look at God's glory. So we'll stand together as we sing glorious things of thee are spoken. Let's stand.
Well, good morning, everyone. It is lovely to be with you this morning. I felt very honored when your pastor, Greg, invited me to share the pulpit this morning. Uh, As mentioned, you can be turning to Psalm 3 uh, if you have a Bible. Um, I'm going to be preaching from the English Standard Version, um, but feel free to follow along with whatever version you have. Um, A few weeks ago, I was trying to describe to a friend back home Bonfire Night. Um, And just, you know, the story of Guy Fawkes, and it's just very intriguing to an American uh, listening to this, like you guys celebrate that he didn't blow up a building, and you celebrate by just setting off fireworks. And so I, I ended up making the comparison, yeah, it's kind of like, not exactly, but it is kind of like, if you can compare it to the 4th of July. Um, fireworks and the 4th of July are synonymous in the States, fireworks, bonfire night, synonymous here. And we do that often. Our family has often been navigating that reality over the last five years of trying to make comparisons and parallels between this culture and our culture back home. For example, if, if you are in the States, you cannot get a Cheeky Nando's. You can't go out for ch- chicken sandwiches or a chicken meal at a, a Nando's. We've never heard of Nando's in America. You don't get the little sauces in the, the shops. Um, but we do have something kind of similar. It's called Chick-fil-A. We love Chick-fil-A. So we can get Chick-fil-A there. We can get Nando's here. There's kind of a parallel, kind of a similarity. Uh, you can go down through the list. I love baseball. Baseball is like America's pastime. Baseball is not as easy to come by here. you got cricket, yes. You've got rounders, sure. I'm not quite sure how either of those sports really actually work. But they are equivalents. They are comparisons of baseball. And then, obviously, you have iron brew. And in America, actually, there's really nothing that compares to iron brew. I tried to explain it as like bubblegum soda. I don't really know. Um, There's really not a comparison there. But still, nonetheless, regardless of the specifics, there exists a parallel that connects a common experience from here in the UK to there in the US. Well, as we examine Psalm 3 this morning, we're going to notice an even greater parallel that bridges not an ocean, but time and space, thousands of years, parallels born out of specific circumstances in the Old Testament that carry meaning down through the ages and speak to our modern hearts. And so as we read our text this morning, I want to keep in mind this simple truth as we do. Our God is a God who saves. Yes and amen. We would all agree with that statement. But more than that, our God is a God who provides the faith to believe in his salvation, even when the circumstances around us tell us that it's impossible. And so let's read this psalm together and then begin to unpack it. The title says, A Psalm of David When He Fled from Absalom, His Son. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, There is no salvation for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Selah. Some of you might be thinking, why did the guest preacher pick a psalm that talks about God striking down enemies and breaking their teeth? He could have preached any passage. Why would he pick that one? And that's a fair question. That is a fair question to ask. But ultimately, I would just come back to this reality. We believe that the Word of God, down to the letter, is always relevant. It is always timely. It is always purposeful. If only we seek the Spirit's help in illuminating that reality to our hearts. 
So all of God's word is profitable for teaching. And so my prayer this morning is that we would walk away from this time in this psalm more confident of that reality. That we would see how down to the letter on the page, this word is relevant to our lives as we seek to follow after our God. And specifically, I want to draw our attention to three parallels between David's specific situation here in this psalm and how it relates to the saving faith that we have because of Jesus. Three parallels. So if you, if you take notes or if it helps you to process information, just think about it this way. There's three points here, three parallels. And here is the first. Recognize your plight. Recognize your plight. Look again with me at verses 1 and 2. He says, O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Now there are a few things that we learn at the outset here that will be very helpful for us as we seek to gain perspective from this passage. The title tells us not only that David is the author, but it also tells us the circumstances from which he is writing, namely, when his son Absalom attempts a coup and sends David running for his life. The details of that account are recorded in 2 Samuel chapters 15 and 16, and we don't have time to dive into that account and look at that narrative in extensive detail this morning, but it would be really helpful for us to begin to put ourselves in David's shoes as we unpack this psalm. Think about this for a moment. Let this frame our time. The king of Israel, who was anointed by God's prophet Samuel, and he was promised by God himself before this time, that his line would produce the Messiah, that God would actually bring about the salvation of the world through his lineage, that there would be a kingdom established through his bloodline that would never end. And he is here with that reality, with that promise, and he has learned that his son has been quietly leading a rebellion against him. Even some of David's most trusted advisors have been turned, and he can no longer trust in their counsel. And what's worse, his son has lied to his face about this. He went away and set aside time not to worship, as he told David in that account, but he went away to plot David's death and to usher in a new reign. And so now picture this. Here is David, where he has the safety and the splendor of the palace, and it's all been evaporated. It is all taken away, and now he must flee. He exchanges the comfort of his servants, the warmth of his bedchamber, uh, chamber, now for the cold, hard earth, running as a fugitive, sleeping in caves, not knowing if when he rests his head in those caves, he will ever wake up from this trial. He has been utterly betrayed, utterly abandoned by his own son. Now, most of us have never experienced that kind of betrayal, but we can picture it, can't we? Real scars in our past from family members or close friends, those points in our lives where we confided in confidence with our friend who then turned our vulnerability against us. We've felt that stab in the back of betrayal. There are some here who may have even experienced the betrayal of infidelity from a spouse or deep and lasting relational wounds as a result of your parents or from your children. And the pain of it was and it is real. And we carry these wounds with us because we are broken people in a broken world. And it can feel like there is no escape. And in our hurt, And in our sorrow, we may even be tempted to turn bitter, to become angry with God even, because it feels like even He too has abandoned us. But even if our minds don't go that far, the landscape of our circumstances in these instances, they can feel devoid of hope, devoid of safety. We can look to our future and go, where where is the hope? What am I looking towards? And so it is here with David. 
Those he trusted have deserted him. Those he loves hate him. His son, whom he brought into the world, is seeking to take him out of it. And it is from this place of great pain and uncertainty that David cries, How many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, There is no salvation for him in God. Now that's David's specific place of turmoil. And for some of us, we can relate to it in varying degrees. But as we recognize the parallels here between David's plight with the broader themes of saving faith, we must come to grips with the fact that in a spiritual sense, each of us, left to our own devices, are in even more of a precarious position than David as he is fleeing for his life. We are in graver circumstances without Christ. For without God, we are helpless to throw off the chains of death and eternal destruction as a result of his righteous wrath and judgment against our sin. The scriptures teach us over and over again, and our hearts testify that we cannot, no matter how hard we try, save ourselves. When we recognize our great need before God and we acknowledge, as David did elsewhere in Psalm 51, that in sin we were conceived. And when we affirm with the Apostle Paul in Romans 6 that the reward for that sin is death, and we testify along with our Lord Jesus in John 14 that no one comes to the Father unless it is through Him, then and only then have we begun to embark on this journey of saving faith. Hope and redemption begin with the recognition of the dire circumstances that we are in apart from God and and our own inability to remedy it. There is nothing we can do to rescue ourselves from this perilous reality. We recognize our plight. But secondly, as we think about these parallels, we remember God's provision. I want you to see here the glorious nature of the scriptures, the supernatural ability of the word of God to speak in a moment in time with words that contain promises down through the ages to us. Pick back up with me in verse 3. We're going to continue on to verse 5. It says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried, aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. Do you see this turning point for David here in verse 3? He is on the run. There is seemingly no way of escape for him. The end of his reign, and yes, even his very life, is just around the corner, it seems. They are hunting him down. But he cries out, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. David remembers who his God is, and he remembers what his God has promised him. And that reality trumps even what he can see around him in that moment. He trusts that the one who made the promise will bring it to pass. And this juxtaposition of verse 2 where it says, they say there is no salvation for me. And then you butt that up against verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. You take them and you put them together. Those two verses encapsulate the entire gospel. I can't help but think of the first few verses of Ephesians 2 where Paul lays out the stark contrast of our plight and then God's provision In Christ, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Saving faith. It does not care what the odds are. It doesn't care how it appears that everything is stacked against it. It trusts in the provision and the promise of God and it rests in the only one who can rescue. You may find yourself this morning wrestling in your heart with what you've done in your past or maybe what you are presently doing in the private sin of your life. And you may be even listening to the lies of the enemy or of your own flesh that says, if people really knew who you were or really knew what you were up to in your heart, they would know that that you are a lost cause. Or if God really knew, there is no way that he would offer forgiveness or that you could be loved by him. I want to encourage you this morning, if that is you, do not believe that lie. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that says you can never be loved, you have gone too far, your sin is too great. That is not the voice of God. Instead, would you trust in faith that God's promise of salvation is extended to all who would earnestly cry out for it? David cries out from the trenches of his soul in verse 4. He says, I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. David looked to the promise of the Messiah who would come from his line. And even in that cave, he found great comfort and assurance that what God had declared previously would one day come to pass. And this is where it gets really, really good for you and for me this morning. Do you see from where God answered David in his plea for this rescue? It says, from his holy hill. Many Bible scholars would say that David, even in this moment, has a prophetic vision of the Christ who would answer humanity's cry for redemption from that holy hill of Calvary by shedding his blood and dying for the sins of the world on a Roman cross. And so here is, here's the hope for us. If we cry out to God in repentance, it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done. If we simply cry out to God in repentance and faith for him to take away the guilt, to take away the shame, his reply is sufficient for Jesus himself when he hung on that cross before breathing out his last breath said, it is finished, it is done, I am taking it away. And that is really, really good news for us this morning, news that reshapes even what we thought was possible for our futures. Man, it is good, good news from a good God who loves us. I want you to see the effect that God's reply to David had on him. Remember, it's worth reiterating, David is far from home. He isn't even sure that the people that he is now with are really actually safe, that they would have his back. He has no place to lay his head. And the last thought that must go through his head as he lays it down, not on a pillow, but on a rock probably, is, will I ever wake up? Like, if I go unconscious now, are these people going to just come and take me over? But he trusts what God has promised, and he is comforted. He says in verse 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke again. For the Lord sustained me. To know that the God who made all things does not grow tired. He does not grow weary. He does not lose consciousness. That he is always vigilant. Always aware of everything. And he has complete control over every breath that we take. And he has already allotted the days that we will walk on planet earth. Even before we have yet to live one of them. David could sleep soundly. He could actually lay his head down on that rock and go to sleep because he knew that whatever took place while he was unconscious, it was planned 
and it was purposed by a good and gracious God. Psalm 121, verse 2, says it this way. And just as an aside, if you have little ones at home or who are afraid of the dark or who get spooked by the shape of the light as the lights go off, speaking from personal experience, this is a really good verse to teach your children, to, to remind your heart as you lay down and go to sleep at night. Psalm 121 says, My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. What a beautiful truth for you and for me to be reminded of this morning. It is safe to assume that COVID has caused us all to collectively contemplate our mortality in a unique way. Think back to those early days of the pandemic, and you'll remember that everyone had this heightened awareness that life as we knew it could just be upended in a moment. Things could be canceled. Things could be shut down. You could be left in your home, and reality as you knew it was completely different than it was the day before. And the testimony that we heard over and over again from those who contracted the virus in those early days was how terrible the nights were that they feared their breathing would slow to a stop in the night. And I want to be very careful here. I want to be considerate and compassionate because for many people, those breaths did stop, including some in my own family. Nowhere do these verses guarantee our physical safety. But they do point to a hope that is far greater than the hope of a vaccine or a full recovery. God's provision for those who trust in his saving faith means not only did Jesus die in our place, but he came through death and he changed what is possible for us even as death is a real reality. He showed the world that the end of our story does not have to be growing old and slipping away or getting sick and taking a turn for the worse. No, he showed us that for those who recognize God's provision in Christ, through his resurrection, there need not be an end at all. The type of faith that David displays here is a faith that says, I can rest assured that even if I don't wake up tomorrow here on planet Earth, I will awaken more alive than I have ever been and with the one who made all things. For it is he who keeps watch tonight, who will not fall asleep at the helm, who is neither shocked nor daunted by the shocking nature of these present circumstances. He knows what is coming next, and he has already rescued me. This is the faith that we have if we trust in Jesus, if only we reach out and we take hold of God's provision, which he has offered up to each of us from that holy hill. Saving faith begins with a recognition of our plight, which in turn leads us to fall upon the provision of our God. But then lastly, I want you to see here from Psalm 3, the lasting change that comes about as a result of taking that leap of faith. So third parallel here, like David, will we receive God's power? Will we receive God's power? Notice the change that takes place in David as a result of his trust in God. Pick back up with me here in verse 6. He says, I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. What a transformation, what a journey he has been on in just these few short verses. The reality of verse 1, many are my foes, many are rising against me, many are saying there is no salvation for him in God. And now he's declaring, I will not be afraid. 
is David getting cocky? Doesn't he know that he is still in very real danger? What is this divine swagger that he is now declaring that God will even break the teeth of his enemies? There is clearly something at work in David as a result of his faith, and it's namely the Spirit of God emboldening him to walk in the promises of God. If we're honest, we can get a little uncomfortable at times reading parts of the Psalms where David or other writers request for God to judge or destroy those who stand against them. It could almost feel like David is putting a cosmic hit out on his enemies, like God is in the business of being a crony. But it's very important that we do not interpret these verses with such debased thoughts. That is not what is going on here. These imprecatory psalms, as they are called, which is just another fancy way of saying a request made to God on behalf of a sinner. They shouldn't be kept at arm's length. We don't have to hold these verses at arm's length and just gloss over them. For there is even mercy in these verses. We should recognize that it is for the good of all, even those whose teeth may be dashed as a result, that their plans do not prosper. It is good for all that the plans of God would go forth, for there is mercy even in their defeat, because they will know that the character of God is good, and that they may even repent, and they may even be restored. Psalm 83, verse 16, is a psalm of Asaph. It's a really clear example of this. It says, Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. And so there's even this implicit restoration here, this opportunity for David's enemies, that they may see God's promise fulfilled in David's rescue and the enduring reign that he will have after this uncertain time, and that they would know that the God of Israel always keeps his word. But how do we translate these realities to our lives? Are we to call on God to smite our enemies? Is, is that the implication here? Well, the answer to that is yes, if, if we understand that our ultimate enemy is not flesh and blood. It is not people. We are not called to strike down people or ask God to strike down people. David wrestled against flesh and blood here in these verses, but we know in an ultimate sense our true enemy is not of this world. Our great enemy, Satan, along with his demons, they are the truer and they are the greater enemy. And like the foes in David's life, they are seeking to destroy and to distort God's ultimate plan and usurp his ultimate throne. That is what the enemy does. He, he knows God's purposes and plans for the world. He knows that God has set a narrative over the world, that he is restoring it, that he is saving it, that Jesus, it ends with Jesus on the throne. And the enemy is doing all that he can to make that not a reality, but he is powerless against our God. We take heart because they are powerless. They can do no harm to us and our God's plan will not be thwarted. Revelation 7 with every tribe, every tongue around the throne room of God in heaven is a reality regardless of the enemy's efforts. The scriptures remind us of these truths. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 57 and 58 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Colossians 2, 14 through 15, By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. He put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. If you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are clean. You are loved. You are forgiven. Your past does not matter. It has been dealt with once and for all. You are eternally safe in the arms of God. Period. Nothing else in this life can offer that kind of security, that kind of hope, that kind of peace 
because there is no longer power in the voice that whispers, you're not good enough. You're too messed up. Jesus has dealt with all of that. If you are listening this morning and you are not sure where you stand with God, or if you're just checking out what, what is Christianity all about, I want you to hear that regardless of what your past looks like or even what your present looks like for that matter, God knows you intimately. He sees all of your scars, your sins, your hurts. Nothing is hidden from his sight. And all of these things that can try to keep us from him, that our enemy says is too much to sort through, they are done. They are dealt with in Jesus once and for all. So that now you and I, we can take hold of this free gift of eternal life. We can take hold of the forgiveness that he offers us through his son on that cross that is promised through saving faith. And we all, as sons and daughters of the true king, may declare with King David, salvation belongs to the Lord. Let that be an anthem song for us as we go from this place, as we go back to the streets of our neighborhoods, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our homes. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. Salvation belongs to him. His plans will triumph. And then we can say, along with David, as sons and daughters of the true king, your blessing be on your people. Selah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that it is enduring, that even something seemingly obscure and alarming from an account of a king thousands of years ago has deep relevance to our lives today. We thank you for the supernatural power of this word, that it is saving lives, that it is speaking to our hearts, that you, God, speak to us through your word. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen each of our faith, that you would help us to have confidence in the victory that has been won in Jesus, and that the confidence that we have would rest in him and not in our own efforts to try and clean ourselves up. That we would be a gospel people filled with great grace towards the sinners in our lives around us and that we would be proclaiming a clear and bold message of salvation and forgiveness in the Son of, Je of God. Jesus, we thank you that your blood is enough. We thank you that it gives life, that you have defeated death. We pray that you would help us to love those around us and to proclaim the excellencies of your kingdom until you come again. Amen. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, yeah, that's great. It's just wonderful, isn't it, again, to be reminded of God's care for us. Right, we're going to just remember why he is qualified to give that care just now as we sing our final song together. There is a higher throne. And as we sing that, we remember where God is now. He reigns on his throne where he protects us. Let's stand together as the music starts.
and coffee afterwards and a bit of time just to chat together. Uh, that'll be through in the room on your right through there. Um, and a correction for the notices from earlier, Gift Sunday is in two weeks time on the 5th of December. Uh, that was my mistake. We'll just finish with those words from the grace at the end of 2 Corinthians. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.